In this photo, you see a diver on the bottom of the sea floor, motionless. Her name is Tina Watson, and you're probably wondering what happened to her. Well, let's find out. Hello, friend, and welcome back to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also professional photography. Smile. But today, we're looking at the case of Tina Watson and her husband of the time, Gabe Watson. You're going to learn about what transpired through the course of their relationship. Today, we're hopping on a kangaroo all the way to Australia, Queensland to be exact, and as of 2020, it has a population of around 5.2 million people. If you ever find yourself here, you can go and see some beautiful scenery at the Daintree Rainforest. Or you can go to the Australia Zoo and see a bunch of different wildlife. Queensland has the world's largest coral reef system and one of the seven wonders of the world, the Great Barrier Reef. It's home to many different species, and yes, the corals are alive. You can even go scuba diving here, but you might want to be careful who you go with. And that actually brings us to our story today. Christina May Burge was born on February 13th of 1970 in West Germany. She liked to go by Tina, so that's what we're referred to her as. There's a bit of a bizarre story about how she had to be adopted by her biological mom, Mary Cynthia Cindy Burge, because she was legally registered as the daughter of her mom's ex-husband. She was then legally adopted by Cindy and William Edwin Tommy Thomas sometime after Cindy and Tina moved to the United States. I'm guessing what happened is that Cindy and Tommy had an affair. At the time, they lived in Walker County, Alabama, but they would ultimately end up in Birmingham. Tina also had a younger sister named Alonda and was just a part of a very loving, caring family. She was described as being bright and happy and just knew how to light everyone up. As a child, she was diagnosed with PSVT, which is an abnormally fast heart rhythm that causes palpitations, fainting, convulsions, and occasionally death. She was put on a prescription drug that helped to control it, but the side effects made her feel ill and took away all of her energy. It was around this time that she started to attend the University of Alabama. Tina was tired of having to take medicine for her PSVT, and so she decided to have surgery, and this was done on August 16th of 2001. From this day forward, her family said that she was remarkably healthier. Her relationship history is pretty vague, but she was engaged to a man named Scott McCulloch and she decided to call off the engagement. One of her friends named Melinda Caton said that Tina's mother didn't like him or approve of the relationship. Tina then started dating a guy named Stan Marks for about two to three years, but they broke up in December of 2001. On New Year's Eve of this same year, she went to a party and met a man named David Gabriel Gabe Watson. Gabe was born on March 5th of 1977 to David and Glenda Watson. He was considered to be a nice, friendly guy who could get along with everyone. He had a few previous relationships with other women, but appeared to still be on good terms with all of them. One of Gabe's biggest hobbies was diving. He started going diving in 1996 with his friend from elementary school, Michael Moore. He went on well over 50 dives, and many of them were very deep into the ocean. A few weeks after Tina and Gabe met, they ended up dating. There's many different reports about how their relationship panned out, but overall it appeared to be pretty healthy. Except for the fact that Gabe seemed to be a control freak. In late 2002 to early 2003, Gabe had bought an engagement ring and planned to ask Tina to marry him. With this ring, he put it in a bag on a shelf and ordered her not to look at it. Very off-putting behavior. On February 10th of 2003, he called Tina's dad Tommy and asked him for Tina's hand in marriage. Tommy said to him, you have to ask me in person. I don't know why he thought it was okay to ask over the phone. That's really weird. But on February 15th, the two met at Books A Million Coffee Shop in Hoover, Alabama. Gabe asked him for permission, but Tommy never actually said it was okay. Gabe would then wait two months until Easter Sunday on April 20th. He set up an Easter egg hunt at Tina's apartment and wrote a note for her to find asking her to marry him. She jumped up and down, screaming in excitement, but it was later revealed that she never actually said yes or no. Gabe and Tina's relationship, like I said, was good, but they didn't live with each other or see each other as often as they'd like. According to Tina's friend, Amanda Phillips, if Tina wanted to see Gabe on the weekend, 
weekends, she needed to learn how to dive and take a course, so Gabe ended up talking her into it. The two of them were set to graduate, and as a gift, Gabe was promised a trip to Australia to dive the Great Barrier Reef. Gabe's mother, Glenda, said that it was Tina's idea to make it a part of their honeymoon, and so they extended the trip another week. Tina started to take diving lessons at a place called the Dive Site, with an instructor named Tom Jackson. Her course began on March 7th, and she ended up finishing it on June 8th. Tom had said that Tina was not very comfortable and was probably the most panicked diver he ever worked with before. She only had completed about 10 to 11 dives, and this was including the training dives in the pool. Most of them were at a depth of around 30 feet, while the Great Barrier Reef was around 90 feet. Throughout the rest of the summer, and before their wedding, Gabe kept trying to get Tina to increase her life insurance policy and make him the sole beneficiary. At the time, it was Tina's father, Tommy, who was the beneficiary. If someone is trying to make you do this, I feel like nine, maybe 10 out of 10 times, they are trying to get rid of you. But it wasn't possible for Tina to increase her insurance until after she returned home from her honeymoon. Not too sure why. She also never made Gabe the beneficiary, and I believe that he thought that she did. Also, Tina's parents really didn't like Gabe and were not fond of his family either. The date is Saturday, October 11th of 2003, and their wedding is finally here. It was beautiful, and it was held at Southside Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. The reception was at the Pickwick Hotel, also located in Birmingham. Next was their honeymoon, which like I said earlier, they went to Australia. They left the United States on Monday, October 13th, and arrived in Sydney on October 15th. For six days, they went to Darling Harbor, the aquarium, the Australian Museum, they went on the Manly Ferry, and they went to the Opera House. The first week was to be spent as Tina's week, and the next week would be spent as Gabe's week. On October 21st, they flew to Townsville, which is in northern Queensland. Gabe booked a dive trip on the Mike Ball dive expedition boat, the Spoil Sport. Their main goal of the trip was to dive the shipwreck SS Yangala. It sank during a storm in 1911, and it's been declared as a historic wreck. It's considered to be one of the top dives in the world, and coral has started to grow on it, making it a very interesting attraction. There were a lot of things that went wrong, and a lot of laws were broken during this trip. At 8 p.m. on October 21st, Gabe and Tina boarded the spoil sport and were using their own equipment. Besides them, there were 12 crew members, three commercial divers, and 23 passengers. First off, let's look at this chart called the safe scuba system that explains how deep you're allowed to dive and what you're allowed to do. On the left, you have diver experience, and on the right, you have dive conditions. Green is less than 15 ocean dives and has less than 0.5 meters swell minimum current. Yellow is between 15 and 50 ocean dives and has 0.5 to 1 meter swell moderate current. Red is more than 50 ocean dives and more than 1 meter swell, 20 knots or strong current, 25 meter death, dusk, night, drift, or a wreck. Under this system, Tina and Gabe should have been interviewed separately, but Wade Singleton, the trip director, failed to do this and interviewed them together. Gabe was an experienced diver, but he wasn't that experienced. He had done 15 ocean dives, but 55 total dives. Wade failed to ask him any questions about this and gave him the go-ahead that he was in the red. Tina had done 10 to 11 dives, but only five recorded dives, and none of them were in the ocean. Because of this, she was a green diver, and under something called the Code of Practice, she was required to have orientation for any dive she went on. She was offered orientation for a night dive, but not for any other dive. Wade was supposed to indicate that they were green divers by marking it on the forms that they filled out. He failed to do this. He was also supposed to mark their status using a colored highlighter, he failed to do this. He was also supposed to attach tags to their tanks to indicate what level of diver they were. He failed to do this. He was also supposed to post a list on the dive deck of all of the divers' levels. He failed to do this. Considering that this was a red dive, which would be pretty dangerous for people who are considered novices, it's very alarming that someone would have been that negligent. At 9 a.m. on October 22nd, Tina, Gabe, and four others went into the water to begin their dive. A few minutes go by and Tina and Gabe return to the boat because Gabe says that he has a problem with his dive computer. He then flipped the batteries around and they went back into the water. A few minutes later, Gabe returned to the surface and said that Tina needed help because she was drowning. One of the diving organizers went down and found her and brought her up to the surface and tried to resuscitate her for 45 minutes without any luck. Tina Watson was pronounced dead at the scene. So. 
What happened? How did this all occur? Well, when the police talked to Gabe and the divers that were in the water with them, they found out some interesting things. They questioned why Tina was on such a dive in the first place and why Gabe and her declined to have a guide go with them. Gabe said that what happened was that a huge current hit them as soon as they hit the water. They were being pushed along and constantly moving. He said that Tina indicated she wanted to go back to the anchor line, so he pointed to his inflator hose and motioned to Tina to put air in her buoyancy compensatory so that way they can float up. When she did this, apparently nothing happened, so Gabe grabbed a hold of Tina and started to head back to the anchor rope. He said that she then accidentally knocked off his face mask and so he let go of her so he could fix it. By the time he got himself situated, Tina was sinking with her arms up. Gabe tried to grab her, but she was out of his reach, and so he swam to the surface to get help. He never once tried to help her himself. The police were not buying the story. The other divers who were also in the water at the same time said they described seeing Gabe in a bear hug with Tina right before she began to sink. Gabe was supposed to be Tina's dive buddy, but he didn't try to inflate her buoyancy control device or remove her weight belt. He also didn't share his alternative air source with her. When Tina was brought to the surface, she still had a regulator in her mouth, her tank still had air, and they did tests to see if her equipment was faulty. Nothing was wrong with any of it. When Gabe went to see Tina at the morgue to identify her, he was accompanied by his mother Glenda, who flew in from the United States. Two investigators, DSC Geringer and SC Lawrence, were also present with them. They stayed in the waiting room while Gabe and his mom entered the viewing room. Soon, his mom would leave the room to leave Gabe alone with her. While he was alone in there, Lawrence overheard Gabe say a few things in a low, mumbled voice to Tina. He said, I am so sorry. I never meant to hurt you. I shouldn't have kept taking you down. I'm sorry I couldn't stop it. This was all that Lawrence heard, but to me, this sounds pretty ominous. Gabe would soon go to court, and the prosecution said that his actions stored on his dive computer contradicted what he had said. They also believed that Gabe turned off Tina's regulator and held her until she was unconscious, and then he turned the air back on and let her sink before surfacing himself. Tina's autopsy revealed that her cause of death was drowning and evidence of air embolism. Gabe was charged with murder in Australia, but he pleaded guilty to manslaughter for a lighter sentence. The judge sentenced him to four years in prison, that would be suspended after he served 12 months in prison. This would later be increased to 18 months in an appeal, but still, 18 months for that? Gabe served his sentence in Australia, and once it ended, he was deported back to the United States. As soon as he landed, he was immediately arrested and then charged with murder in the state of Alabama. The prosecutors there believed that they had the jurisdiction to charge him because they thought he had planned the murder while still being in the United States. A short while after, Gabe ended up remarrying a woman in 2008 named Kim Lewis. Kim would be there throughout the entire trial, and many people said that she was a lookalike to Tina. The prosecution said that Gabe didn't ascend as quickly as he said he did, and that this showed he had enough time to drown Tina. They said that he turned off her air supply just long enough for her to stop breathing, and then he turned it back on. The prosecution then entered this photo into the evidence, which is just a haunting photo. They also argued that his motive was money and he wanted her life insurance policy. The defense argued in their opening statement that Gabe received no money and that he had no reason to kill Tina and that it was nothing more than a tragic accident. They asked the court to dismiss the case based on a lack of evidence and in a very shocking motion, the judge Tommy Nail dismissed the case. He what? So in other words, Gabe Watson was a free man. A short while after this, Tina's parents complained to the police that the flowers and gifts that they would leave on her grave kept being removed and vandalized. They tried to attach them with chains, but it kept on happening. And so the police set up a hidden video camera at the grave. This revealed who was behind this, and are you really surprised? The video showed Gabe using bolt cutters to cut and remove the flowers and gifts from her grave site, and then they threw them into trash cans. What a sack of shit. Tina Mae Watson was a bright and happy young woman who had the rest of her life ahead of her. Sadly, it was cut short for absolutely no reason at all. I hope that she's resting peacefully and enjoying the life after. As for Gabe, well, <laughs> karma certainly is a bitch and she's coming. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second YouTube account with my brother named Horror Flying, where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.